Ruth Carrico, the University of Louisville. So I'm going to just start off with some interest stuff that I have, and then we'll just kind of wander away into the topic. So you are the editor of APIC Text, is that right? Yeah, I'm the, um, the editor of the APIC Text, uh, starting in the 2005 edition, now through the 2009, and then on including the APIC Text online that's in progress now. That's a big job. Oh, it's huge. It's definitely a labor of love. So you have to, I think, uh, be really immersed in infection prevention and then really love the education side and then be willing to um, spend the time that it takes to gather all that together. But uh, the rewards certainly outweigh uh, any What cons. are the rewards? Well, the rewards uh, of working on the APIC text are not only you continuously learn, which is really where we are in our field. It's a, a field of continuous learning and continuous improvement. But it also enables you to actively connect with other professionals in the field, other people that are expert in the variety of areas, the content areas that are relevant for infection prevention. Wow, that just seems kind of overwhelming to me. I'm amazed. I'm in awe of you. <laughs> don't, don't be in awe of me. It's, it's a, a, a fun uh, opportunity, but I think even more importantly that when you reach a point when you're in any career where it's truly more than your job, it's really more than even your career, but it's something that is so profoundly interesting that it just captivates you and it makes you want to do more, makes you want to learn more, and gives you then that opportunity to say, I really am interested in the skills that I have or the opportunities that have been afforded to me, and I want to make the best of it. So how did you get interested in infection prevention? What was the... Well, I started in infection prevention really in kind of a unique way. My responsibility in my healthcare facility was really one of the problem solver. When there was an area that was in trouble, uh, then my job was to go to that area, uh, learn about it, develop some kind of an intervention plan that then could potentially be handed over to someone else. So I was sent to the infection control department at that time, um, and they had uh, struggled with uh, a number of issues, and I was sent to that area to learn about it, um, see what, what the needs were, develop some kind of an intervention plan, and when I got there, I immediately fell in love with the content area. That you kind of know when you're in an area where it's your affinity. And it's like mental Tetris. You know, all of a sudden things just tend to fall in place and you feel like that this is truly where I need to be because it makes sense to me. And I was fortunate not only at that time, but uh, to be in that area, but to also then be connected with a mentor who just happened to teach in the exact way that I learn. I've often told him that he could probably teach me nuclear physics. I don't know a thing about nuclear physics, but he could teach me uh, a subject uh, that is that difficult. So I was really blessed with that opportunity to be in, in an area that um, really needed some work. It was an area that I immediately fell in love with. And then uh, it's all history since then. So I've had the, the good fortune then of connecting with some absolute um, wonderful and marvelous mentors in the field. I've been able to connect with new organizations to expand that, that knowledge. And every day it's something that I can say that I'm lucky enough that when I get up every day, I'm excited about what the day brings. And so now here you are at this nexus between these two organizations. Tell me about how you came to be here. Well, with the, the collaboration that we have now with um, APIC and AHE, it's really, uh, we often talk about how things are uh, influenced by timing. And I think this is one of those uh, opportunities where uh, now at this point, people are really interested in and in beginning to appreciate the role that the environment plays in not only infection prevention, but in infection transmission. So we're looking at, from the infection prevention and control perspective, what is it that we need to have in place that enables others to do the right thing and prevents them from doing the wrong thing? So what are those both human factors approaches and the competency approach that enables the environment to be appropriately addressed? So this collaboration is the opportunity to bring together the subject expertise, subject matter experts in infection prevention with subject matter experts in the environment and then see what happens when those two get together, share information and share knowledge, all with the same goal of making sure that our patients are safe and our healthcare workers are safe. 
So what are the areas of opportunity when that magic happens? You just well, when, that, when you get people together then that have not only the, the knowledge but the desire to make a difference, then I think that's when you see the real magic happen, that you begin to see that synergy that comes about when people begin to share ideas and then one idea builds on the next idea and that you truly see that explosion that occurs when you combine creativity with knowledge, with desire, with passion about a particular problem. And you talked about the competency and the human factor. Tell me a little bit more about those. Well, I had the, the good fortune of working with a group of very skilled infection preventionists um, a couple of years ago, and we really looked at and began to explore that idea of what are those basic competencies that need to be in place for our healthcare personnel if they are going to be truly effective in preventing infection, both the transmission and the acquisition of infection. So um, we put together a process that pulled in even more experts in the field to help us begin to compile um, a set of competencies and then some of the measurable activities that are associated with those competencies um, into a single framework, into a single document uh, that we started off with. Um, at, after we finished, then we knew that our next step was to take that and actually see, does it work? Is it applicable in a particular area? And if so, what would be that area um, to, to begin that work? Uh, Denise Graham had, had talked to me on a number of occasions about Patty Costello, the executive director of, at that time, a, a, the organization had a different name, but now uh, the organization name is AHE. I talked about uh, Patty's leadership and her ability to pull groups of people together and really her vision in seeing how to have manage this problem uh, in, uh, in an effective and in a sustainable manner. Um, and Patty and her group had just pulled together a wonderful document, Practice Guidance, that had a lot of the basics about uh, the environment and the attention to the environment. And it very much paralleled our APIC text. So this was kind of the, the Bible for environmental services professionals on how to get done what they need to get done uh, with respect to the environment. So it was a great opportunity to say, here we have an executive director that is committed to infection prevention. She has a very strong leadership team, uh, her finger on the pulse of the workforce, uh, and this great document. Um, so uh, Patty agreed to work with me to take a look at what they had put together for practice guidance so we could see how much of that actually was targeting back to and directly aligned with competencies, the, the competencies that uh, we had developed for the uh, hospital-based healthcare worker. And I have to say that they were just right on target. And I was, of course, thrilled with that because not only had they done all this, but it was almost like she could see that it was important to outline specific practices have them outlined in a way that is measurable um, so it can be transferred from one setting to the next and that it's useful in terms of teaching those people that actually perform the process on the front line. So it was helpful for those people that are doing the work, it was helpful for those people that are training and teaching others about how to do the work. So really it was just like, uh, it was a wonderful um, experience, really a gift. It's like how could somebody have known that, and they were doing this all in parallel and, and we didn't know it. So it was even more of a lesson to say that, you know, there are a number of us that are involved in infection prevention. If we talk about ownership, it's all of us that own this and it's our responsibility to look out beyond ourselves and to try to see who else is working on this. Because in my 35 years of healthcare, uh, healthcare work, I have never met a person, a healthcare worker, who wanted to harm a patient. I've only come in contact with healthcare workers who want the best for their patients. They want their patients to be safe. They want the, them to be able to go home and get back to their optimal level of function. They want to be safe when they go to work uh, themselves as a healthcare worker. So when you've got groups of people that are committed and devoted to that, how can you go wrong when you're going to work on a collaborative effort? Now talk to me more about the human factor and why is that important? 
Well, human factors, uh, as we have learned a lot from, uh, we have a very esteemed colleague in, in infection prevention that really introduced uh, the ideas of human factors engineering. And, and the basics are, you know, how do you manipulate or how do you um, handle and, and manage the people and the tasks and the tools and the environment. So basically it enables people to do the right things and it prevents them from doing the wrong things. Uh, so uh, developing then processes where you empower and enable people to do what they know they need to do and that you remove then the capabilities to do the wrong thing as well as you remove the obstacles to, to being able to do the right thing. And I think one of those obstacles to doing the right thing uh, that you need to remove are the inability or the confusion um, with respect to what exactly are the processes that I'm supposed to do. What am I supposed to do? How is it measured? How do you tell me when I've done the right thing? Uh, as well as how do you let me know when I've done the wrong thing? So that whole idea of feeding back results, just like all of us, if I do a job every day and no one ever tells me whether I'm doing it right or wrong, what do I assume? I automatically assume that everything I'm doing is correct. And so we get back to that age old process and that saying that you measure what you treasure. If you treasure the outcome, if you treasure the process, then you're going to measure it. And so this project, I see, gives us that opportunity to develop those very sorts of tools and practices and resources that we want to measure. And it's a way for us to, you know, put our money where our mouth is, that we do treasure this outcome. Therefore, we're going to measure the processes. And talk to me a little bit about collaboration. What's, what's the opportunity that's there when you talk about bringing prefe infection preventionists and people in the environmental services group together? Well, I think as an infection preventionist, it's, it has long been evident, but probably never more apparent as it is now, that I really need to actively seek others to work with. That it's not all about me and it's not all about my work, and I don't control the, the work. I don't control, in many times, the outcome. But I do have the ability to identify people who do people who can influence uh, how the practice goes, um, how the an initiatives are implemented, what sort of outcomes occur, how do we change those. But my job in infection prevention is identifying all those people that have that role with the attention, the intense attention now that the environment has. The first people that we need to go to are our environmental services professionals and realize that just like um, uh, from a nursing perspective, nursing is my background, so when people talk about nursing, they talk about everybody from the nursing assistants who are providing the predominance of the hands-on care up through then the ranks to uh, the nurses that are supervising the care, nursing leadership, uh, and so forth. Uh, but it's the whole, that whole context. The same thing with environmental services. We have those that are performing the day-to-day -day attention to the environment. Our environmental services personnel who are there in the patient rooms, in the operating suites, uh, in the exam rooms, in the, the clinic settings. They're the ones who are doing the day-to-day -day operations with respect to the hygienic uh, processes involved in the environment. But we have to also pay attention to those that are supervising and training them and those that are in their leadership roles. So uh, it makes then our collaboration important, not only in terms of breadth, but in terms of depth. You said the intense attention that's being brought. T tell me more about that. Well, we're realizing that the role the environment plays in infection prevention and in transmission is real. You know, in the past, if I look, look back and I think about you know, how important was the environment and how did people judge whether or not the environment was, quote, clean, it seemed like that we looked at the floor. If you had a shiny floor, you had a clean facility. You know, if you could just sort of, you know, get the environment cleaned and clean the, the patient's bed and their furniture and the room, um, that, was, uh, that was extra. Just make sure that floor is clean. But now we know that, wow, what were we thinking, you know, when we did that? That, you know, now we have organisms that are exceptionally hardy. Uh, they can live on surfaces for prolonged periods of time. And I don't just mean hours or days. We're talking weeks and months. Uh, so those organisms can be there, um, can be uh, involved then in movement from a healthcare worker, from the, the environment via a healthcare worker's hands, directly to a patient or to medical equipment that is going to be used on that particular patient. So it's much more than just making sure that instruments are sterile. 
It's making sure that the, the, the environment in which care is rendered um, is not involved in the transmission of infection. That when that patient comes in, they are not subject to what the patient before them had. And we know that right now that's the situation, that a, a, a risk to a patient actually involves what the patient before them had. So we've got to stop that. Again, use that ability to intervene effectively so that what was going on before in that patient room has little or no bearing to what goes on now. And so what can this program, this year ahead that we're looking at kicking off this evening, what can this contribute? What's a best case scenario? Well, I think the, the project that we have now, I think we'll start with a very important step, and that's going to be discovery. What is it that we need um, from both sides? What is it that we need from the infection prevention side? What is it that we need from the environmental services professional side? Where is the overlap? And then where is that synergy that will occur? Where we begin to get together and we're looking at, at the same problem through two different lenses in some respects, and then we can align that lens then so our goals become very clear. Um, the types of activities and ideas that emerge uh, are based upon knowledge about what activities uh, are occurring on both sides, uh, what sort of ideas are occurring from both sides. And just like, you know, we've all seen that, um, that commercial about, oh, you know, I should have had a V8. Well, now I think we're going to have that opportunity where we're all going to have that aha moment and we'll see then many opportunities that were right in front of us and many of the answers were right in front of us just waiting to be discovered. So to me, this is a, a very exciting opportunity where we have the chance to maybe have the shades come open and to see things that have been right in front of us but we just haven't recognized them. And it shows that together we recognize many, many more things than we would have recognized separately. So you're sitting in both organizations. You remember both organizations. You're active in both organizations, very active in both organizations. So what do you see as, give me a, give me a sense of how this partnership can enrich each. Well, I think a partnership between these two organizations can be of tremendous value. Um, it starts oftentimes with recognizing the role and the value that each other plays in a shared problem. So we have a shared issue. Uh, we have, we're bringing two different skill sets to the table. So the first thing and the first step is to almost be introduced to each other. So who is it that, uh, that we are working with? What do they do? What are they all about? And as oftentimes happens during any kind of discovery, we really see people as um, much more than the individual or the organization that um, they were when we first got started. I often think about when we have a, we have our awards banquet at, at my facility, and it's so much fun to see people that will come to this awards banquet all dressed in, you know, their dress and, or their, their suit, and they are with their family, and they're much more than the person that was in the uniform at the facility two hours ago or three hours ago. And it makes you think about them very differently because you've gotten to know them in a different way. And I think that's uh, very similar to what will happen as this collaboration gets started. That all of a sudden we see two different organ organizations that are very much focused on the same thing, but are approaching it from different perspectives. Uh, but we see then where our paths cross and the importance of having our paths cross in a way that is, is perhaps um, more structured. Um, or perhaps given the opportunity to be developed and explored more fully. So once we get past this initial stage then of discovering what each other are all about, then we begin to address and, and question situations that we both encounter. Uh, we are, are able then to bring some experiences uh, with some exact situations, some specific stories that demonstrate what we're talking about or some of the challenges that we have. And then we're able then to see, well, how could we approach this perhaps differently? It gives us the chance to say, you know, we're going to forget how we approach this in the past. That obviously, you know, as we all know, you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, you get the same results. If we truly want different results, then what we have to do is say, you know, we've approached this problem through door number one, 
now let's look at door number two and see what happens. So let's take a different approach and then see what, what comes of that. Uh, the nice thing about any experiment like this is you're never wrong, right? You just learn from the experiment. So there isn't necessarily a right way or a wrong way, except if you try it uh, the no way. So if we don't enter into this relationship at all, how will we ever get things to a better place? So without taking this opportunity, um, I see no hope in us being able to get to a place where we all clearly know we need to be. So having this chance, I think, is, is monumental for not only infection prevention, but our very goal, everything that we are working toward is ensuring that our patients have a very safe experience and that our healthcare workers know that when they come to work, their work opportunity is gonna be very safe for them as well. So if we have the chance to influence that, I don't know how we can go wrong. So besides the patients, besides the IPs, besides the people in EVS, who else stands to gain from this collaboration? Well, both organizations stand to gain. Uh, clearly, that if APIC and AHE are able to continue to refine the processes that, that they have uh, within the, the association and their responsibilities within the association, they're better able to meet the needs of their membership. Not only better able to meet the, the needs, but it, they're more effective, uh, they're more accurate, they're more sustainable. Uh, and, um, and are able then to address perhaps problems that haven't previously been um, identified, uh, haven't previously been approached. So it's that, again, that continuous growth and development for both organizations. Well, well said. So what are your hopes for participating on this uh, panel? What I look forward to as a, a participant, it's always about what can I learn? What am I gonna see and what am I gonna hear from people who are dealing with this every day? Because I have to say, not a day goes by in my work that I don't wanna slap myself on the forehead again and say, why didn't I think of that? Or that's such a simple approach. Or why didn't I consider that? So every day is an epiphany. So every day is an opportunity to learn from people uh, that I'm around. So uh, having this occur at a conference where we have people from all over the United States and beyond that are able then to bring their bit of knowledge, uh, their story, uh, their vignette about uh, the approach that they have had or a situation that they have encountered, the richness that you can get from uh, pulling people together like this, you simply can't get in other ways. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful. Kind of stunned. <laughs> <laughs> And if it's a good dinner, wow. I mean, that, that makes it all worthwhile. <laughs> so is there anything that you're interested in hearing from some of the other members of our panel, like, for example, Dr. Rutala or Dr. Weber? Um, anything in particular that you're hoping that? Uh... Well, I, I always want to hear about, you know, what is new, what is occurring, what is emerging with the science side? Because we have to make sure that our activities aren't just something that we pull out of, out of the air, but that there has to be some kind of science basis. Now, having said that, we know everything there is to discover is huge. Everything we know is just a very small part. However, we always start with what does the evidence tell us and what is the evidence showing us where th there are gaps or there may be new learning opportunities. So we always want to start and say, you know, what can we learn from the science? And I think certainly uh, Drs. Rutala and Weber are the, the people that, they're the go-to people in terms of the science. So we want to see what they, uh, what new information they bring and then think about, all right, well, how is, does that have meaning? Um, how does it uh, influence my practice? And then we can take that and determine, well, how is that gonna affect my practice in whatever work setting I have? Whether I'm in a major medical center, whether I'm in a small rural setting, whether I'm in a, an ambulatory surgery setting, some kind of a clinic, a physician office, home health, long-term care, you can see that you have to be able to somehow translate that science into practice given the uniqueness of the many healthcare environments uh, in which care is provided. Now, Marita and Kathy have a uh, history together of creating great collaboration at their facility. Um, do you expect that over the course of the year you'll find other case studies where you have a lot to learn from the way things are being carried out? I think we, we find that there are many opportunities where people have already learned 
in their facility? Who do I need to work with? Who is interested in this? Who has a shared vision? But what we haven't had the opportunity to do is learn from that. So settings like this where we bring people together, where they have the opportunity to share stories, um, maybe through other areas like social media, where we have then the opportunity for people to say, let me tell you what I did. But making then that, that opportunity for somebody to do that, where we really are demonstrating that we value what people have done. Not only the successes, but we also want to know about well, what happened that didn't work. Um, what do we learn then from, again, those experiments? Because remember, you know, an experiment, you're not right or wrong. It's something that you just learn from. So we want to see what have people done, what are the good things that have occurred about that, what are the mistakes that they've made. Certainly all of us have made the mistakes. Um, and we want to have that sharing then in the type of environment where people don't feel badly about uh, talking about what didn't work. Uh, just as much as we want them to feel good about telling us what did work, but there's a lot to learn about, um, about uh, failures uh, from processes. So uh, share that as well. What areas do you see that's ripe for breakthroughs right now in terms of the collaboration? Um, ripe for, for breakthroughs, I think, are taking a look to try to determine who are the best teams. Uh, we have done a lot of um, pulling people together and um, uh, trying to identify people who may have specific areas of responsibility. But sometimes we don't dig deep enough to actually identify, well, you may have a responsibility in that area, but you may not be the one who is the most knowledgeable about the very essence or the elements of practice. So digging down and finding those people who actually do the work tell me who's doing the work, who can give me the best insight into what is happening, enable them to come back and in some type of an environment that's really very safe so they can really tell it like it is. Um, because again, if we don't really peel that onion and then figure out you know, what's right at the core, how are we going to know about the problems that need to be solved? And again, if we think everything is fine and we don't question and we don't drill down and we don't dig, we'll never really find the true answer.